Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Dennis Duke Wonyala. If you're new here, ensure that you subscribe. I'm super excited, super happy. We finally reached 200 thousand subscribers that's a very wonderful milestone and what a better way to celebrate that milestone by bringing you better and quality content today i moved about 38 to 45 kilometers away from capital city kampala and we are along mitiana road i have visited a farmer yet very enterprising his name is sema ganda joseph we shall be talking to him about how he started his goat farm he has goats he has cows he intend to do a couple of things around here but the most important thing that i also needed to note is that how he started with about three and now he has over 90 and he has sold over a hundred goats so this is gonna be an exciting moment so please stick around and watch till the end but before we go into a very short break i want to remind you that we started sungura house a place where you can go and eat your rabbit meat in all forms we are located in bokoto just after the traffic lights as you're heading to chisasi in case you need proper directions reach me out on these numbers and i'll be more than glad to help you so let's go into the discussion today and we welcome our lovely guest mr semanda joseph Semaganda. Semaganda yes, Joseph. Yes, Semaganda Joseph. I am confusing the name. They are all Baganda. Semaganda, Semanda, uh, Abona. How are you, Sebo? Exactly. Yes. How are you? I'm fine, sir. We How are super are excited that you've hosted us finally at your farm. Me too. It's a pleasure having you here today. Okay. Yes. It. So, viewers, we're going to talk to Mr. Joseph uh, Semaganda on how he started. So, let's start uh, from uh, way back. So, how do you come along Mitiana Road? For me, I stay in Kavuma, mm. where I keep dairy cows. Okay. And because they are a bit expensive mm. as compared to the goats, I decided in case of any problem, you may not sell your animal at a cheaper price. So how could I supplement my animal in case I want one million? Mm. And I don't sell off my dairy cow. So I opted to go for goats. Okay. Which on goats, by seeing YouTube videos of you and I miss, I learned that you can even sell a goat at one million, a single goat. So I was so much inspired okay. to start. So I bought three goats okay. in 2020, mm -hmm. June. So from there, I kept on adding up mm -hmm. to 40. That's how they multiplied up to this number where we had around 130 to 140. Okay. So to anybody who is willing to start goat farming, I have three things to tell them. First of all, the personal factors. Then you have the economic factors and a master plan. You, the person who's going to start a small farm or a big farm, the first question, you have to first assess yourself. What kind of a person are you? Are you passionate about farming? That's the number one factor to consider. Are you the kind of a person who merely falls to seek because you have made a loss in farming? Are you the kind of a person who can manage people who never went to much schooling like you? People of different temperaments and different personalities. So what kind of a person are you? Are you someone who looks at the process before money mm -hmm. and you endure the hardships involved in the process? At what stage of life are you? Are you the kind of person who is so busy that when you start this farm, you will not be allowed mm -hmm. or you are there once in a month or totally abusant? Mm -hmm. All those factors when you are going to start a small farm decide your success, whether you succeed or you fail. And again, there are some economic factors. Do you have the working capital to invest in the business? In the process, you'll be in negative cash flows because usually this business takes one to two years before giving you profits. Another thing to consider, if you have assessed yourself properly, I would call it self-assessment or self-profiling over a bit to start a business which requires persistence, patience, management, and availability. Because it takes time for word of mouth to spread. So in farming, if you are not patient, mm -hmm. you can't succeed. So it needs someone who is patient with this project because it's not that like a, opening up a shop mm -hmm. that when you open it today, from tomorrow we're going to start making profits. So in this means it needs patience. So you have to first assess yourself and know, can you go through all those hardships before succeeding? After self-assessing yourself, then you must have a master plan. The master plan tells you where to start from and where to end. So, if you have your little money or you have your piece of land, the size of the land, 
decides the type of the grazing system you are going to use. Yes. If you have two acres of land and you are going into this business, want to do a serious business, you can't do free range because mm. you keep very because you won't animal. have you won't even have enough land for them to move around. Yes. So it's better you go for zero grazing mm. because at least an acre mm. on zero grazing mm. can accommodate thirteen to twenty goats. Mm. But still, it depends. Do you have enough feeds on that single acre? Because even if you have an acre or two mm -hmm. or five, when there are no feeds, still you can't support 20 goats. So as long as we're talking about the size of the land to start, mm -hmm. what matters on the land is the amount of feeds that you have on that piece of land. So if you have your piece of land and you want to start mm -hmm. like with 20 or five or three or two, the first thing you should put into consideration are the feeds. Okay. The common mistakes we all did when we are starting we are so much excited mm. on the animals yes. that Forgetting we, we do not focus so much on the feeds, not knowing that these animals need feeds. Okay. That's the common mistake that we farmers mm. who are starting did. Mm. So if you get a chance and watch the videos of those who have made mistakes, you don't fall in the same category. Again, you should seek for knowledge. You can make research, make farm visits, YouTube channels, and many visit those farms which fit your style of farming. If you're going to do zero grazing, mm. visit those farmers who fit your style of farming that you wish to do so that you can learn something. Let's talk about um, when you were starting. Mm. What ch other challenges did you have uh, away from uh, just feeding? From feeds? Mm, away from feeds. Uh, we faced a challenge of kids' death. Mm. We knew nothing about steaming up mm. when you have a pregnant goat mm. or pregnant goats when they are about to deliver, how you feed them. Mm. So we, we had we had badly savings mm. during that period. We lost kids because we had less knowledge about that. We lost a number of kids through miscarriages just because most farmers want to stock pregnant goats. Mm. That is very bad because they usually suffer from a shipping fever when they are good from where you have bought them. You are bringing so you are bringing it. Another challenge was where we sourced our breeding stock that after going from my friend Ham, getting some, then the distance is very far, they are a bit expensive. There's a goat which is around 200k, then you opt for that, which is a very big mistake. For the success of a farm, your breeding stock matters a lot. Where are you going to source your animals from? What quality is there? If you go and buy goats from the local markets, mm you're going to make a lot of loss along the way. It is far, far better. You get your goats from a recognizable breeder and you bring in very good breeds, which shall bring back your profits earlier than buying cheaper ones. Mm. But in the long run, mm. they will be so, so expensive. They usually say that cheap things are expensive. Yes. Mm. Another mistake we did, and many farmers make when they're starting, the order of implementation at the farm. So. Most farmers, they buy even animals before preparing the shelters, before preparing feeds. Mm. So for a farm to succeed, mm. a farmer who is going to come into this business should know the proper order of implementation. That is the master plan. What comes first, followed by what and what. So mm. what should come first at any farm, if you have secured your piece of land? The first thing even before constructing shelters should be preparing feeds. As the feeds are growing, you're also Doing what? Constructing the shelters. Mm. So as you're constructing, as you're you're constructing even your feeds mm. are growing. Mm. Then from there, getting the workers mm. who manage those animals. Because m many people are starting this business as a side hustle that they will not be available mm. throughout. So it's good to search for workers. Mm. Then the animals come in when the feeds are ready, when the shelters are ready, mm. and animal handling equipment are ready into place. Mm. And another thing we faced as a challenge, we stalked animals during a rainy season. It's very challenging. Very deadly. You suffer from a number of diseases. So uh, and, uh, another problem we faced was that we had little knowledge about the veterinary work. Anybody who's going to come into this small farming or big farming should take time and acquire knowledge on the basics of veterinary work. Reason being, there are times when your goat is about to deliver, you don't have a vet, it's not allowed, maybe the phone is off, you're going to lose an animal. Because the theme of small farming is you have to keep small problems small. And it's another way of saving some money. Because even if 
your good half cough, diarrhea, every time you call a vet, it becomes too expensive. Oh, before we even continue, uh, this gentleman, Semaganda uh, Joseph, has a YouTube channel. Can you tell them about your YouTube My channel? My YouTube channel is BGM Animal Breeding Farm. BGM Animal Breeding Farm. Yes. The first comment that has been pinned on this video in the comment section has his YouTube channel, so please go there. He equally has good content. You can uh, see what he does, some of the things that he uploads on that particular video. So please go and subscribe and follow him as well. I'll also leave the numbers in the comment section, but also if you want it, you can reach me out. I can uh, exactly link you up with Mr. Semaganda Joseph. So Semaganda Joseph, let's start also, uh, let's also talk about how much money did you start with? Lucky that for us here, the phone, these wooden stuffs here already. Mm, like you had so trees, on the, trees on the land. On the land. Mm. So it's what we used. Okay. I did not construct a lazy house, though I, I know it has many advantages mm. over this ground floor house. Mm. But in the beginning, what, are, what matters most is to start. Is to start. Mm. And you start with what you have where you are. Mm -hmm. So it's what I started do with, okay. with. I started with what I had. Mm. So it became cheap. I just bought the nails and some sheets. And since I started with it and I kept on adding, you know, at times it's so hard for someone to buy these improved breeds because they are a bit costly. Mm. But as long as you can afford getting 500k, you mm. buy one because that's what you can manage at the moment. Mm. So you keep on adding, adding on. But as long as you source it from a recognizable breeder, okay. that is what matters most. So in simple terms, like we want to quantify, somebody would be there outside there thinking, oh, maybe I need 20 million, maybe I need 5 million, maybe I need this much. How much should somebody have? The, the much that someone should have mm. depends on the big picture he has. Mm. Some, someone who wants to start and he feels that I want to start with 5, mm. or I want to start with 10. Mm. We can't compare him or her with someone who wants 50 or 100 or 200. So if it's about starting, mm. for someone who has more money, mm. he can start with 100, even if he has 100 million. Mm. But someone who feels that I want to do good farming, mm. I have my small piece of land. What makes a business sense? Mm. I would recommend at least 10 goats. Okay. But if you can afford, like someone who's receiving his or her salary mm. monthly and can save 500 and buy one one per month, mm. it is still possible, even if we start with two. Mm. But what matters most is the back we are going to use. Because people can source locals mm. at a cheaper price and then they use a pure back. Because a, a good back is half your head. So that matters most. Mm. The back you are going to use in your herd. Mm. So even if you want to buy goods of 250, the locals, mm. make sure you get at least a savannah oil boa, which is a pure, even though it is expensive, to bring back the, the money. profits. So that, that's what they should consider, the beginners who are coming into this the business. business. How long have you been doing this thing? I've been doing this, it's one and a half year. Wow, one and a half years and you've been able to attain all this uh, level of success. Um, how many workers do you have? Right here, mm -hmm. I have around eight. So take us through everyday routine. First of all, early in the morning, what we do first is make sure we keep the place clean. Mm -hmm. Since we don't have less ground, even if you have less shelters, mm -hmm. still hygiene is the key to fighting diseases. Mm -hmm. So we make sure every day early in the morning, we the, the sleep room, the, and make sure the place is clean. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, from there at around 9 to 10, we start giving them feeds. We have some maize, some silage, mm. maize silage. Uh, actually, we bought maize stovers. Because for anybody who's going to do zero grazing on a small piece of land, what you should consider first, how can you source cheaper feeds and produce expensive ones mm. at your farm? Mm. You have to make sure that at least you grow perennial crops at your small piece of land. And the onions, at least you source them. At the here we don't grow maize. We have alfalfa, we have coris and napier. So we says we source maize stovers allowing from the neighborhoods. Then we do our silage. Then from there we add in some rice and maize bran, mix him some premise like a primary and brown salt. 
That's what we mix and feed our animals. So for any incoming farmers, as a way of having constant supply of feed at the farm, I would encourage you at least if you have three acres, make sure that the two acres, the crops that you are going there can save for at least five to six years. Instead of growing maize, which is going to be harvested twice a year, it will make more sense if you grow crops, which will stay there for five to six years. On AP, as long as it's optimally managed. Mm -hmm. That's how playing back the dung and the manure. So instead of growing maize, mm -hmm. it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. I know it has more protein, protein content, mm -hmm. but at least you can supplement the, from the free choices. Okay. So it makes business sense if you grow those ones, which can stay there and can be harvested several times a year. It will make a lot of sense. Okay. So that's how we mix our feeds and we give them. Mm -hmm. At times, we, we let them go down there and they feed freely so that they can get yeah, their different nutrients we, which we can't provide. Mm -hmm. And we put their mineral blocks, as you can see, all over the place mm -hmm. so that you can supplement them further. Mm -hmm. That's how we feed our animals. Okay. Then after lunch, in the evening, again, we feed them and we allow them to go there. In the future, because we are preparing more feeds, we want to do totally zero grazing. But we are still preparing more feeds because we have learned from the dry spell we are greatly hit. Mm -hmm. And for any farmer, even if you have big junks of land, I would say that prepare some feeds for the dry spell because the seasons have already changed. You can no longer rely on the weather conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's far, far better you prepare your feeds. We are still talking to Mr. Semaganda Joseph. His farm is found along Metiana Road after Blova after Bujuko, uh, what's the after name of this it's area? It's called Chihuahu, Chihuahua. Mubango, sub-county. Mubango, Chihuahua. Mubango, Mubango. sub-county. Okay, it's, it's Mitiana? Mitiana, or? Oh. Mitiana. Okay, district. so literally we're in Mitiana, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who want uh, to contact him, of course, I, I, I told you I've left his number in the description or in the comment section. The first comment that I've pinned, has his details, his YouTube channel, so please go there and subscribe. Let's now talk about diseases because it is very imperative that we understand diseases, otherwise somebody could actually lose their entire flock. So I know that there are different farmers I have talked to, I've talked to Boji, I've talked to uh, a couple of them, and they have different diseases. All I've, What I've realized is every farmer, every farm has its own individual problems, individual diseases. Mm. As you, what problems have you had in terms of diseases? The major problem I'll first here a bit the worms. Mm. Our goats have been heavily affected by the worms, but in the beginning the problem was mm. we are doing under dosage. Okay. So when you learnt that mm. and even changing the deworming cycle. Mm. If we change the deworming cycle, at least there you can break the cycle of those worms like you do all the worms use injectables like you can use about first ten percent mm. after one and a half month or two then you use by mectin plus mm. at least they have been able to fold but when it comes to diseases if you want to control diseases the first step is make sure your animal are in good health by feeding them properly it is a natural for anything which has life to fall sick mm. but the immunity will be so high if they are well fed mm. Because I saw in a dry spell when we were having shortage of feeds, mm. how we are affected. Mm. You, could, you could see cough, you could see flu, you could see some diarrhea just because of the feeding, mm. the change mm. uh, due to lack of enough feeds. So, there are, and another way of fighting against diseases, you must vaccinate. Okay. Vaccination is a must. If you want to produce goods and you are going to be a breeder and you want to sell goods to a field, farmers mm. and make a name you must vaccinate from one month old you give them the cross studio vaccine mm. then you give them the PPR the CCPP you go to Brussels Meritensis OFS and goat pox mm. at least in Uganda you are mainly affected by that those six diseases uh, so when you vaccinate against those ones the others will be so simple some fever as long as you have the, the thermometer you you, you 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 put it insert it there mm. you shake and see then you give maybe oxy or pain or any other medicine necessary okay. depending on the diseases but here many have been affected by the worms 
the one burden which is affected that's in the beginning we are warming mm. the warming but the problem mm. we are giving under dosage like if, if if they say give 500 grams you're giving 200 grams okay so, so have you by, by having people like you mm. fellow farmers because for me i would rather be saved by criticism mm. than to be praised and i feel yeah true so i welcome other farmers to come here mm. i keep on visiting other farmers so that i can get and acquire more knowledge so i can i can become better is there a market for goats or it's a business i can get stuck with my goats and i have nowhere to sell them what i know in in any business mm. when you have entered in any business quality matters okay that is what matters even if you have a thousand sub standard goods you will not get market mm. so never ever sell a product which is below premium if someone comes here mm. they point out i want that one mm. because at times on the feed troughs some are not allowed to eat properly mm. so they grab it thin mm. so if you want a market a stable market to me mm. as me mm. you should try to produce a product that is competitive, that on, is the competitive on the market mm. however much they are saying there is no competition mm. In good farming, it's true that demand is beyond, but they're not looking for substandard mm -hmm. goods. They are looking for quality. So what matters most is far better to have ten or five, but quality goods. The market will be readily available, available. because people are looking for the best. Mm. Yes. So we've come to the end of our video today, but let me give Mr. Semaganda an opportunity to say his last remarks before we end the show. So the fellow farmers and those who are coming into this business and those who want to perform better. Mm. Never wish for less challenges, just wish for better. So never stop learning because the world never stops teaching. Keep on learning, you become better. In order to achieve a better and a far better success, you have to first change yourself. The problem with fellow users, mm. they think people will come and change them. So we are started with three. Now look where we are. Mm. We have even attracted then, then to, to come to the service, farm. I'm very happy to have you exactly. again. Mm. So, success to some people. So, to me, I know that success is not in achieving. Success is in becoming. What have I become by starting God Farming? Mm. I'm starting to be known to the world. Okay. I'm getting money. I'm mm. getting good friends. Mm. So, it's not in what I'm going to get like money. Mm. It's about what am I becoming. I'm almost becoming a vet, yet I never went there. By the way, I've become a carpenter. Mm. <laughs> I now hit a hammer seriously. Yes. So you can see. So people should not look on, on, on money mm. as success. Having a hundred goods as success. So success is knowing your purpose in life. True. Rain towards reaching your maximum potential. Sowing seeds which benefit others. That's why even the little knowledge I have, I'm trying to share it with other farmers. farmers yes. Perfect. It's about having had an issue of uh, kids or your babies, baby goats dying very easily. Um, much. Mm. How did you handle that? Uh, we have learned how to handle that. That's why you can see we have some kids already into existence. Mm. So we learned that as long as a kid is born, from three days you give it some amount of vitamins. We, we are not aware of that. We give them some amount of vitamins, like at least two to three meals, after every three weeks for the first one month. From three to a month we start spraying them. From a month, we give a cross studio vaccine. At one month or three weeks to one month, we started deworming them. Because they have started nibbling on the grasses, so you must deworm because they are greatly affected by the worms. Mm. Uh, their body immunity is still weak. Mm. And again, we separated them from the mother by having a kid's pain, mm. so that at least they don't suffer from the ammonia, from the pains at night. Those animals are very fearful, they can step on them and they die. And again, heavily pregnant dogs, we separate them towards the river. Because one day we are spraying, mm. they were all together, they squeezed their and they aborted. Wow, uh, sorry. Uh, also, uh, what about the mothers before they, they give birth to the kids? Anything special that you do for them? On steaming up, mm. yes, but it's, it's not good to overfeed pregnant mothers. Mm. Why? They, towards, because at times when they are overfed, they suffer from, it's called the prolapse, yeah? they can have a vaginal prolapse, or it's called the uterine prolapse, or no prolapse. Because at times the baby overgrow in size. Mm. They should be properly fed, but not overfed. Mm. Because if we overfeed them, there can be complications during giving birth. Mm. So it's far better 
you feed them well, properly satisfied, but you shouldn't overfeed them. And you shouldn't underfeed them. If you underfeed them and if you want to feel them, like when you see my hand here, when you taste like this and you feel those lips in the hip cages mm -hmm. and you feel it feels like here, you are underfeeding them. If you are properly feeding them, when you touch here like this, yeah, there are some, you can feel the bones, but the minimum mm -hmm. uh, size. If you feel it feel like this, mm -hmm. this is overfeeding. <laughs> okay. So you can test from here. Ah. Yeah. Wow, that's a wonderful technique that we've learned today, how to test uh, whether underfed, properly fed, and overfed, <laughs> particularly for the pregnant mothers or pregnant goats. Uh, Mr. Semaganda, let's talk about uh, the breeds of goats that you have onto your farm. Which ones do you have? I have savannas mm. and boas. I have a few pures mm. and some crosses, but with good blood percentages. Okay. I like two to three locals. Those are for my friends when they come here for slaughter. Ah. Mm. When, when this comes, comes we enjoy it. Now we've been here, we've mm. been eating goat meat. Mm. Gwe. You just have to visit the farm. So, for me, I prefer the exotic ones. Mm. Reason being, they can make more money within a short period of time. Mm. Because their growth rate is so fast, they grow so fast. And besides that, because their breed is still unlimited, so they are, they are expensive. Mm. If you are on zero grazing and you are keeping a goat of 250k, mm. you are not in that business. You are giving it a lot of feeds. You are growing the feeds. You put in a lot of effort when you are growing those feeds and you have a goat of 250. It doesn't make sense. And I wouldn't even recommend a 75 unless if you are just starting, starting. with a 75 mm -hmm. and you put in a very good back to improve. It's far better for someone to have 10 goats which are worth 1 million each mm. than having 30 mm. which are going to give you 6 million. Mm. Because you'll we'll be doing a lot of work unless if you are looking for manure. But if it's not that, it mm. makes business sense to have at least 10, which is 87 plus, mm. you properly feed them. Because I've seen that we are looking for numbers, but quality matters. Mm. So what you have, so for me, I prefer the exotic one mm. because they can make money quickly. They have a faster growth rate and the honoring is almost the same. As long, the risk is in not knowing. We suffer not because we had little knowledge, but since we are improving, there's no risk in handling this exotic one. So for me, I prefer the boas and the savannas mm. for that reason, because at least they can make more money. Even if you have 20, 20 pures, okay. it is far better than having 100, locals. 100 locals. You can see. Mm. Even those ones, they are accessible, they are everywhere. Mm. Who will look for you because you have locals when they are only five? Mm. Any someone who is going to take them for slaughter. But even if you have 20, they come for two or five, mm. because the people are looking for good bucks. Like that back, you can see that, that small board there. Mm. I bought it three million. Why? Because I want to improve my herd mm. in the future. I mm. sold off my then I bought. It is still young, mm. but because you have to prepare the future now, mm. you can even look, take good genetics home. Even but most people are probably what big ones. Mm. Even if it doesn't have good genetics for them, they consider that size. size mm. Yet it's about breeding. Mm. Uh, in terms of there are people I've heard uh, who say that. They, they, they kind of fear, they have a fear of raising the exotic ones. They say, oh, our conditions in Uganda cannot afford mo mostly the pure ones. They, they think, well, it will fall easily sick and then it dies. Is it something you've experienced before? Not at all. Mm. For me, as I have said earlier, the risk is in not knowing. Even if you're handling a local and you don't know how to handle it properly, still to die. Mm. Even if you have a pure and you don't know how to handle it properly to die. So the risk is in not knowing. But if you know what to do, so the number one thing is to seek for knowledge. How to handle the pures. Go to those people who have the what? The pures. Because they eat the same feeds, they sleep in the same houses. Now we have the pures here. Look at the shelter. We are even on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. You can see how it looks like. They go down there, they feel like the locals. So there's no complication, but the only risk is in not knowing what to do. But as long as you have learned how to handle them, there's no risk in having these ones. Okay. Again, like I usually say or usually do, I have this moment where I ask a farmer their opinion on whether to have a raised structure or an underground structure. 
usually I want people to outweigh because different farmers have different opinions, have different views. Mr. Semaganda, you have, we have not seen any raised structure at your farm, yet you're still doing good. What, and yet people say that raised structures are better. Indeed it is. Raised structures are better, mm. but again, the initial costs mm. are a bit high. Mm. So it's far better for me. I invest the money in the animals mm. instead of raised house. Mm. In the future, I can do that after getting profits. Because you may find someone like this one, and mm. it, it is laid properly, it is raised, but in the end, it has four or five goats inside. Mm. Mm. And it's not going to sell the shelter, mm. because I will never sell this one. So I will sell the animals. Mm. But as long as you maintain hygiene on the ground, for, like now, it is a rainy season. Mm. But still, they are not all that that because we try to maintain the hygiene. Okay. So we, we use these ones, very simple houses, because we want to minimize the co initial costs. Okay. Because the hardest step of all is starting. But if you have your money, you can lose your structures. For, for me, what I emphasize here, I, they make sure they sweep every day. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't even wait for two days. Every day, they make sure they sweep and they love it and they used to it. They have no problem with it. Okay. And again, when it comes to structures, there are some components of a good structure, uh, like here. You must mm. have an exercising area. Mm. There must be a, 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 a spin. space. Mm. There must be a crash. Mm. And like, because we are semi intensive, mm. there are feed troughs okay. and a water source where they can just take water from. Okay. Mm. Um, so, in simple terms, what Mr. Semaganda is saying is if you have the money, you can go ahead and construct a raised structure and even if you have the money fill it up with goats but it would not make sense for you if you have little money to go into uh, building expensive goat pens raised when in the end you won't have the money to stock your goats that's in simple terms so you talked about um, the rainy season now that we're in the rainy season what happens in a situation where you wake up and it has rained so what we did for us, like we were in the valley, mm. they can't go there in the rainy season, mm. but we paid the feeds. Okay. We have our feeds. So if it over rains and they can't go down, mm. we just open the feeds. We have the silage, mm. we have the hay. Mm. Even if it is still fresh, just to go and cut. So mm. early feed preparation, that's how it comes in. Ah. Mm. You don't have to wait until... Uh, how about the water? Doesn't it affect the water inside? Mm -hmm. The problem is this place has a, that was the old structure. Mm. So I removed it from down there to mm. this side. So you make the trenches, the trenches allowed. Okay. So it it doesn't easily come here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to block this side and the other side and leave it when it's related this side. Reason being that we have no direction. Here the wind is so strong, it comes from all directions. So even the place where I located the matters. Okay. Why did you choose or decide to be growing your own pastures for your animals? Because without feeds, we were not doing farming. And since we are on a small piece of land, we had to, to grow our own feeds. It's a must to grow your own feeds when we're on a small piece of land. Mm -hmm. Because for us, we are planning to do totally zero grazing. So this is alfalfa, which is the queen of proteins. Uh, when, you take in, uh, when you take it in a layman's language, people like schools, I mean, they eat posho and beans. So when you talk about posho, you're talking about croise. Mm. When you talk about beans, you're talking about alfalfa. This is the source of protein because it has a, a protein content of around 16 to 21 eh? mm. crude protein. Mm. That's a very big percentage. percentage. So it helps a lot in the building, the muscles mm -hmm. of an animal. So if you have like just to wind your animals and you have alfalfa, they, put, they will gain more weight so fast. But if you only give it chloris, they will have more energy because that is carbohydrates, energy giving food, and this is a body building, building food. food. So you need to balance between the two. Mm -hmm. Alfalfa in plenty, like 60%, the other like 40%. If you want your animals to grow well, Okay. That's why we chose to plant our own feed. Somebody would be wondering, where do I get the alfalfa seeds? For us, we bought them there at Container Village mm. at a shop called Simlo. Okay. They have good seeds. Okay. Mm. How much maybe in terms of uh, money, packaging, I don't know. The only problem we have as of now, mm. the prices of most of the stuffs 
are going high. So last time when we bought it, it was 40k. Mm. So right now I'm not so sure about it, mm. but it is there. Okay. So when you are planting alfalfa, mm. there are four considerations you should know. One, you should have a well-tilled soil. Mm. What is a well-tilled soil? You properly till it well. Mm. We call it amavonic properly. Mm. You remove, it has to be with free garden before planting. I already made a video on how to plant it. I showed each and everything. Mm. It's there how to prepare from garden preparation. It has to be a weed free garden, mm. well tilled. Because this alfalfa doesn't perform well in weeds. You can see this side and where they have not yet weeded. Mm. Down there you can see even the size. Yeah. So it has to be a weed free garden. You must make sure that your garden is free from weeds. It has to be a well packed soil. Even if you can see here, mm. the soils are well packed. Okay. So that when you slow there the seeds, they can easily fix themselves inside. And again, the seeding depth matters. Mm. You must plant it at least half to a quarter an inch high within these soils. Mm. So that within a square, you see at least four to six seeds on top. If you see no seeds on the ground where you have put them there, it means you have planted them so deep inside. You won't have a strong stand. And again, to have more volume, no more production, mm -hmm. try as much as you can to apply at those organic fertilizers. For us, we are lucky we have the dung, mm -hmm. the dropping from our animals. We put them back. After every harvesting, put them back. So for proper germination, these alfalfa need two things, manure and water. When you control the weeds, you apply manure and you have water. You can harvest them after every three weeks. I've tested it. Mm -hmm. When you read there on the inter internet, you will see one month and one and a half. After three weeks, when you do proper fertilization mm -hmm. and application of water, like now it's a rainy season, if you plant it, they grow very fast. And these grasses, these pastures are not only for animals. They even treat humans. Mm -hmm. Even humans consume them. When they have the problem with the heart, stomach, they act as hubs. It's a super hub. Okay. Since they are regimes, they already maintain the fertility of the soil. Okay. They have an ad advantage that they have very long roots. Their roots can go deep to 30 to 60 meters down. So if they can get the nutrients which are very far from, because most like uh, maize, crawlies, they get the nutrients on the first layer of the soil. So when you have alfalfa, they get the, those nutrients which are very far deep in the soil. Mm. So when you give them to your animals, now you have provided them with vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and vitamin K, which are very good for the overall health of the animals. Okay. Um, how long did you say we take uh, before, from the time you plant and then the time you harvest? So first harvesting, mm -hmm. two months. Two months. Uh, okay, uh, so how do you harvest? You just, just cut, cut or you bring back. your animals and feed? Uh -uh. Mm. I cut them, mm -hmm. then I wilt it, okay. like for four, mm. five hours. Mm. Then I keep it there, so that they dry, okay. not with the sunshine. Mm. Yeah, from but under a shed. Yes. Why do we do that? So that they can retain their nutrients. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you, when you dry the alfalfa or any other grass uh, under the sunshine, it does not? It loses some of the nutrients oh. because it's as if it's just drying. So you just have to wait it mm. to reduce the amount of moisture within. Mm. Then they dry from under the shade. Okay. Then you have to have all the nutrients. So after I have cut and that's all? Yeah, after cutting it, we root it then after like 21 days. Mm. Because if they feel like there's a kid who had escaped, if they feed it when it is so fresh, they suffer from acidosis. Mm. And again, they have some protein. Yeah. So okay. even when you are feeding it, you shouldn't overfeed it to animals because you want them to grow so fast. Mm. Everything should be controlled. Mm, mm. Like a portion. Uh, what I was asking is, um, after I have cut, mm. do I now need to get new seeds and plant? No. Mm. For me at the farm, as I said, I don't plant annual crops. Mm. For me, I only plant the perennial ones. Reason being, this one, if you maintain them properly, they are here for three to five years. Okay. If properly managed. So meaning I cut, it regrows. Yeah, it I grows. cut, it regrows. If someone wants to, to test it, mm. let them give it organic fertilizers and the waters. After every three weeks, and you control the weeds. That's why you have a small portion of it, because mm. it's not easy to manage the weeds. Mm. You need active people, active workers in the mm. garden. Mm. But they grow so, so fast. 
Uh, so the spacing mm. in between the loads mm. should be at least 80 centimeters. Oh, between uh, the loads. The loads yes. Or like spacing from yeah, one, one uphill to, to another. The, yes. Ah, I see. And when you are planting them, mm. like here you can see, mm. as you have done, mm. this soil is compact. Mm. Hmm? So that when you step in it, the soil of the shoe doesn't think to more than a quarter an inch. So the grounds will be firm and well leveled for a better production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that explains why we have lines all throughout. Yeah. These lines are for easy management when you're removing the weeds. Mm -hmm. If you, you plant them in the laws like this, weed management will become so, so easy. That's why you don't just throw it anyhow. So for easy management, you plant your stuff in the laws. So how do we uh, plant Chloris Guyana? For any pastures, as long as you prepare your garden properly and you move the weeds, then you make like kind of trenches. Mm -hmm. We do the lines because for them we will space them two meters. Okay. Yeah? Two but meters it, apart from the other line. Yeah, but you can, even if we space one meter, it will still work. Mm -hmm. But just because you can see in between the lines, when they grow and you leave them to grow, they grow to overgrow a little bit, they drop the seeds in between. Mm -hmm. Instead of using a lot of seeds at, at the start, Use those one, they cover this area, they drop something again, they start to germinate again, and they start suffocating the other weeds. Mm. Yeah, so if the spacing matters, you can do two meters, but in the end, it will cause itself. You find that everywhere there is chloris. Ah. Yes. So, what are the benefits of having chloris, Ghana? Chloris, Ghana. It, it produces hay. And you know that for all ruminants, they need to chew the card you know, because they have the microbes in the stomach. And those microbes are responsible for making the feeds which the animals do what? Do it. Mm. And they turn it into short fatty acid chains, which are necessary for producing some vitamin like vitamin K and vitamin B. So if you, pro you provide your animals with hay, those microbes will be alive and it will also fight, fight the problem of some animals which go into the acidosis side. So to maintain the pH of the stomach. So every farmer, a small ruminant farm or cows yeah, should provide the animals with hay. Mm. Besides that, when animals feed on hay, they drink a lot of water mm. and they eat less because they, they take a lot of water. Mm. That's why you see that people say that in a dry season, goats look so good because they are eating grass which doesn't contain a lot of moisture or water inside. So that's why this chorus kiana is very good. Okay. And besides that, it produces a lot of volume. The production per unit area is so high, so you will have constant supply of feed throughout the year. Because after every month, in a rainy season, in rainy season, when you have fertilized, you should be harvesting. Okay. How long does it take before it is? For ready? the first harvest, it takes three months from planting. Mm. Two and a half to three months, it will be have reached maturity. So it also uh, 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 egg, um, behaves like. Alfalfa where you cut and it regrows? Yeah, it regrows. As I said, for me, I don't plant annual crops. I don't plant perennial crops okay. because we're on a small piece of land and I want to have more here. Mm. Mm. Okay. Wonderful. How do you cut it and do you bale it or just store it as you it is? You can bale it, but just because right now we're in a rainy season and we're we are harvesting and we have a lot to plant, that's why we're just putting it there, okay. as you can see there. But we bury it yeah, locally, okay. using a, a wooden box. Okay. Mm. Separated your laws, you have dug your trenches, we are going to plant. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure you mix it mm -hmm. with some little soil, okay. or some sand. Mm -hmm. Reason being, the, the seeds are very light. Okay. They can easily be carried away by the hair. So, if you mix it in some little sand, you should use the sand which doesn't have stones. Mm -hmm. And you mix it there and you plant them like this. In a line. In a line, mm -hmm. because we don't cover them. Mm -hmm. So, that sand helps hold the seeds there so that they're not taken out by, by the, the wind. Yes. This is the right size for harvesting when they start bringing out the seeds. What a wonderful closure uh, that has been for Mr. Semaganda Joseph. And by the way, we do construction 
of God structures, God pens, both raised and underground. So give us a call on this particular number and I'll be more than glad to help you. We have a recently uh, concluded project in uh, Luero district. There's a, there's a client of mine who recently called me and we are constructing for her a very beautiful raised house. I don't know if you've watched it before this video or you're watching it after this video, but please go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, and you'll find all those videos uploaded there because, well, your support in subscribing has enabled me to move out there regardless of how far, how big the distance is to bring you content that is competitive on the world market. My name is Dennis Dukonyala. Don't forget to visit us at Sungura House located in Bukoto along, at, uh, along at Chisasi Road and eat some beautiful rabbits. Okay, until then we say goodbye.